Isn't there something rich and wonderful about just saying thank you, Lord, for all you do, for all you've given, for all that you are? One of the things I'm deeply grateful for is that through our years of ministry, Sherry and I have made some great friends who also serve Jesus in different places. And Jeff and Chris Mannion are one of those couples that we count as our, just a close group of friends. Uh, yep. And if, if something's going on in life, um, yeah. I know I can call Jeff and bounce things off. Yeah. Right? Jeff and Chris will pray for us. They love our family. They love Shoreline Church. Yeah. Because of that, and because Jeff's a really, really good preacher, uh, we keep inviting him back. I suppose if I really loved you but you weren't any good, it would, I probably wouldn't invite you back. <laughs> That'd be tough. That'd so, be tough. So that's a compliment, right? Uh, but I think this is Jeff's sixth or seventh year in a row being here with us. Now, the last time he came and preached was the week before things shut down for COVID. And I'm not blaming him. I did this. But I'm saying there was a correlate because you went home like the next week, right? And everything. Yeah. Uh, and so it's been... I was the last speaker in that. Yeah, in that yeah, room. yeah. And so it's... Uh, and, and so in and a few weeks, we'll be moving back inside as an option. So awesome. it's been quite a year. So I want to invite you to pray with me uh, for two things. Let's pray for Jeff, that God would anoint him with the Spirit and bring the message and power to us and open up God's Word to us. And let's pray for ourselves, yeah. particularly to identify if there's a place in our lives where we need to take a next step forward, where we're kind of treading water, stuck, not moving, and God wants to do something to kind of unleash us. Mm-hmm. Let's just pray that God would prepare our hearts. Let's pray together. Mm-hmm. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Jeff and Chris, for Ada Bible Church, where they have served for a lifetime of ministry, one church for a lifetime. What an amazing gift that is. Would you bless Ada Bible Church right now as they're here with us? and as, as the word's being preached there. And Lord, would you anoint and empower Jeff as he brings the word. Fill him with your spirit, with passion. And Lord, you have a message for us from a great book of the Bible, oftentimes missed, but, but so powerful and so relevant for today. And then we pray for ourselves, Lord. Prepare our hearts right now. By your spirit, search our hearts and help us just to honestly identify where we're feeling stuck, where we need to move forward in a fresh new way. Lord, there's a, there's a place for every one of us. There's some area where we can take a next step. Speak to our hearts. Prepare us for what you want to do in us and through us and for your glory. Lead and guide this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you welcome Jeff to bring God's word? Thank you, Ken. Well, hello. And it is just it is just a joy for Chris and I to be uh, with you at uh, Shoreline uh, again. We just uh, love being being with you, and just so so grateful we get to share this weekend with you. Uh, I'm going to ask you for a confession. I'm just wondering how many of you have been driving a car that you got stuck in the snow. Show of hands. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Far more likely to happen in Grand Rapids, Michigan than on the Monterey Peninsula. I know. But Chris and I, the house we used to live in, it had a long driveway, gravel driveway, and there was a significant turn in it. During the winter, you'd have about a foot of snow on each side of the driveway. And we had teenage drivers who had over their teenage driver friends who would attempt to back their way out of this long driveway, miss the curve, end up in the lawn, uh, snow right up to the frame. And so Chris and I would be in the house, and one of our kids would walk in and go, "Uh, Dad, (laughs) Dad, need your help. Now, uh, I'm going to give you some advice on how to get a car unstuck. Tuck this away somewhere. Some of you who are copious note takers, file this in a place you can find it later. Okay, step number one, get the shovel, shovel out in front of the tires and behind the tires. All right, so it's kind of like a clear path. And after that, it's kind of like forward, reverse, forward, reverse, forward, reverse. Have any of you done this? All right, when stuck. Okay, next thing, if your wheels are spinning, you can't get any traction, it's icy, you look for something that can give you some traction. So maybe some sand, kitty litter, maybe even put set down some old carpet or uh, even the floor mats of your car underneath your tires so you can get uh, traction. So do that. And obviously, obviously, find someone to push. If you've got a couple hefty friends, recruit them, your grandmother, anyone will work, right? Just uh, to, push on, to push on this car. And what I found, once you shovel and then do the sand thing, get someone to push, if you're still stuck, there's only two things to do at that point, only two things left. One, call a tow truck that can pull you out of the snow. And the other one, the option I usually choose is just walk away. Come back in June. <laughs> Problem solved. But the deal is, is that when you get stuck, I don't mean a little stuck. When you get really stuck, it takes an extraordinary amount of effort to get unstuck. Now, the story of the Bible that we're going to look at today is a story about how some people move from stuck to started, from stuck 
to start it. And it is one of the most popular characters in our Bible. Haggai. Hmm, Haggai. Uh, Jeff, you're going to have to refresh our memory. All right. If you have a Bible, I would love for you to attempt to find the Old Testament uh, prophet Haggai, or if you can uh, look on a, a device that you're using. And I would say, listen, if you can't find Haggai, just find Zephaniah and move a little bit to the right. And you'll find, you'll find Haggai. But it's buried there in the Old Testament prophets. And what I want to do as you're looking for Haggai is I want to give you the backstory, the backstory to this prophet. And the backstory, really, you just need three words. The three words are war, exile, and return. War, exile, and return. Say those words out loud with me here in the courtyard and wherever you're watching from. Ready? War, exile, return return. About 600 years before the time of Jesus, there had been a major war, and it did not go well for Israel. The Babylonian army swoops down. 586 BC destroys the city of Jerusalem. I'm talking burns the city to the ground, destroys the houses, burns the temple of Jerusalem, built by great King Solomon, burns the temple to the ground. That's the war. Exile. The Babylonian government had a policy of deportation. Like, in order to get, keep people from getting all patriotic and doing an uprising, they just move you out of your country. And so most of the people living in Israel are deported to Babylon. And so you're not even living in your homeland. That is the exile. Then uh, the Persians come in. They beat the Babylonians. It's a couple generations later. And uh, the Persians, they had a uh, philosophy not of deportation, but try to appease the people, try to get along with them. And so they said, okay, if you were uprooted and removed from your homeland, you can go back now. Now, all of the Jews did not return to Israel. I mean, that wasn't your home. That was your, like, great-grandparents' home. But there was tens of thousands of people who decided to return to Jerusalem, return to Israel, and begin again. And it was tough because you weren't returning to towns and villages. You were returning to a pit, a, a ruins, a, a hole. I mean, it was awful to try to get things going again. I mean, you plant some little olive tree in the ground. How long is it going to take? before you have a good olive harvest. You have olive oil once again. How long does it take a vine to mature so that you can have a grape harvest and make wine again? So agriculturally, it was difficult. You're beginning to build a house. And yeah, there was, uh, there was that other thing, the temple. The temple was in ruins. Now, the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem, it, it's not quite like a church building. It, it was that one place in the nation that represented God's presence among his people. And so to neglect building the temple was to neglect putting God back at the center. To procrastinate building the temple was to procrastinate putting God back at the center. And to get to work on building the temple was to get to work on putting God back at the center. The people had returned from exile month after month after year after year after year. There the temple sets in ruins. Haggai is the prophet of God, and it is Haggai's job to get these people unstuck and moving again and started by putting God back in the center by rebuilding the temple. So we're going to look at Haggai chapter 1, and we're going to watch how these people got from stuck to started. But just a personal moment with you before we begin. Even as I use the expression from stuck to started, some of you already in our early minutes together know an area of your life where you are badly stuck and you need to get unstuck. I just wonder how many people today are stuck in resentment. Some, something happened, you were wrong, it was awful, it was ugly, but you move past that point of simply having resentful days, and you would say, Jeff, I have become a resentful person, and you feel stuck there. How do you go from stuck to started? 
I can just imagine uh, how many of us today would say that we are stuck in apathy. Some time ago, we just stopped caring. We checked out. We zoned out. We numbed out. We, we have joined the ranks of the professional cynics. And we've descended that slide of the terminally disillusioned. We just don't care anymore. And we're stuck there. Hey, listen, what, what if our gracious God would use the story of Haggai, people who went from stuck to started, to, to move you out of that apathy today, to begin the journey from that apathy today? And I can only imagine that there are many here. There was a behavior, and then it became a habit, and today you might even call it an addiction. And you haven't told other significant people in your life just because of the shame of letting on with what's going on, but you feel stuck there, you feel trapped, and you don't know how to take your first step to break away from that. Let's, let's open the scripture together. Let's see how these people in Haggai chapter 1 move from stuck to start it. And, and I think that it will give us just some great clues as how to begin our journey away from being stuck. Because remember something, when you get badly, badly stuck, becoming unstuck can take an incredible amount of effort. So uh, in our study today, just three different characteristics... Three characteristics of these people as they move from stuck to started. And so uh, characteristic number one, characteristic number one, are you ready? All right, are you sure? Ready? People who go from stuck to started, you ready? They know what time it is. People who go from stuck to started know what time it is. Now, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2, Habakkuk is the prophet giving the message from the Lord. It says, uh, Habakkuk says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. That's the temple. This is what the Lord says. These people say, you know what these people are saying, don't you? The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. And then down in verse 2, you have the word time again, where Haggai asks a question. The Lord asks a question through Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while this house, meaning the temple, while this house remains a wreck, remains a ruin? People who move from stuck to start it, they know what time it is. Now, I think the wording there is critical. When it says, these people say the time has not yet come, I think what they're saying is, you know, we're going to get around to it someday, later, just not now. It's just bad timing. See, they didn't say no. They used a more lethal word, and the word they used was later. We'll just do it later. We'll get around to it. It's just bad timing right now. We're busy with other things. We will get around to it someday. And this is why later is lethal. You see, if, if you resist God's movement in your life and just lock your arms and say no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm going to stay stuck. At least you and God can now have a decent argument over it. But when we've said later, we think we've kind of said yes, just not now. This is why later is lethal, because when you say later, and the next month later, and the next year later, and the next year I'm going to get around to it, later actually means no, but we feel like we've said yes as we're saying no. The time has not yet come. The time, you know, we really need to get around to that. We believe it's, a, it's, it's important. We'll get around to it someday. Just not now. It's just really, really bad timing. Here we go. People who move from stuck to started somewhere in their journey are able to say the two words, it's time. Can you say that out loud with me? Just two words. Ready? It's time. Uh, those of you uh, watching from other places, not just play along here. Ready? It's time. Ready? It's time. It's time. People who go from stuck to start and say, you know, it's time. It's time to set up an appointment with a marriage counselor. It's time. It's time to offer an apology, even if I believe this wasn't totally, absolutely, 100% my fault. It's time. 
It's time to uh, sign up for a money management class that's kind of directed by Scripture to find a way to get out from under this mountain of debt that is crushing us. Uh, by the way, Shoreline is offering such a... I found this out today, this morning. Shoreline's offering a class that starts this week. Uh, money management God's way. And many of you say, listen, it's time. We're stuck. It's time to get some help in this area. It's time. People who go from stuck to started come to a point where they stop saying, hey, someday, 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 and suddenly someday becomes today. It's time. It's, it, it, it's time to begin the practice of inviting God into each and every day in just the practice in the morning of saying, okay, God, I'm yours today. It's time. Last weekend... Uh, between services at Ada Bible Church, we have like a, a atrium area and the auditorium's off to one side, children's wing off to the other side. And I was like heading toward the auditorium. I ran into a guy that introduced himself. Uh, I'm guessing maybe 35 years old. He and his wife had just dropped off three children in our children's program. And he said, hey, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, we've been going here about a year uh, but uh, we, we, we've never met. And as we're walking toward his wife so that he can introduce his wife, he said, we weren't going to any church before we started going here. We had dropped out for like eight years. And then he paused and he said, uh, my wife and I, we were both addicted. And he, he didn't say to what? And it was alcohol, opioids, any number of other things. And, my, and she's standing right there. He says, my wife and I were both addicted, and we have just celebrated 14 months of sobriety. And remember, they just dropped off three kids in the children's ministry. 14 months of sobriety. Listen, I guarantee that about 14 months ago, they looked at each other, and they said two words. What are those two words? It's time. It's time. It's time. Not someday, but today. It's time. I can also guarantee, almost, almost guarantee something else. I can almost guarantee that they were at a point of pain where the pain of staying stuck was greater than whatever fear they had in moving forward in getting unstuck. Characteristic, characteristic number one of people that go from stuck to started, they know what time it is. They know what time it is and later becomes it's time. Second characteristic of people that move from stuck to started is that like that couple I met last weekend, they begin to hunger for God's blessing in their lives. They know that there's something better out there and they want to experience it. They begin to hunger for God's blessing. That's characteristic number two. Now, in the days of Haggai, there were two things that had happened. One thing that would, had happened is they had recently experienced a crop failure agriculturally. There had been a drought, a big drought, a crippling drought. So this was going on. Also in Haggai's day, the temple was in ruins. That was going on. Haggai's job in chapter one is to do this, to be able to say, um, um, this is connected to that. God sent this drought because we refuse, we refuse to put him in the center of our lives. So what I, what I want to do is just read just a couple verses about this drought. It's in Haggai chapter 1, starting around verse 9. Haggai basically is dropping the bomb and saying, by the way, that temple over there that's in ruins and this recent crop failure, maybe these things are connected. So here we go in verse 9. He says, uh, agriculturally, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home from your harvest, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which, uh, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have with, withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all of the labor of your hands. God says here, this is connected 
to this. I am withholding my blessing to get your attention because I desire to be at the center of your lives and not some place way out there on the edge. God sends a drought. He did it in the days of Haggai. I believe he can do it still. I believe that the epitome of spiritual arrogance is believing that God is obligated to bless my life regardless of what I'm doing. Spiritually arrogant to believe God is obligated to bless me and to show me his favor regardless of how I'm behaving, regardless of what I'm doing. So uh, there's this thing called the blessing of God. And it can be confusing. And so what I want to do is break it down a little bit to try to explain what I'm talking about, what I'm not talking about, what I mentioned, God withholding his blessing. So uh, three ways the blessing of God is shown. Uh, Number one, you experience the blessing of God because you're alive. Just because you're alive. Jesus would put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. He would say, the sun rises on the evil and on the good. You can be an atheist, you can say, God, you're not even out there. You can be a total dirtbag, and you get to walk out and enjoy the sunshine. It's the bl- and then drive off in your car to go get an Egg McMuffin, right? I mean, it's like, it's the blessing of God simply because you're alive. That's one way we use the word blessing. Another way we use the word blessing is not simply because you're alive, but because you believe. When you've come to that place where you realize that when Jesus came and died. He was dying. He was, he came to pay off debts that weren't his. He came to pay off debts that were mine. He came to pay off debts that were yours. He came to, when you, when you receive that as your own, realize he came to die for me, to raise to new life for me. This is the way that the Apostle Paul worded it in his letter to the believers in Ephesus, in Ephesians. He say, uh, you now have Every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Every blessing. It's blessing because you believe. It's the blessing of realizing your sins have been forgiven. It's the blessing of realizing all the wrongs from the past have been washed clean. It's the blessing of the Holy Spirit who comes to live inside and change you from the inside out. It's the blessing of remembering that Jesus said, I am going somewhere to prepare a place for you that you don't have to live in crippling fear of dying because when your heart stops beating as a believer, this is simply a door into the presence of Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. It's not blessing because you're alive. It's blessing because you believe. But there's a third way we use the word blessing. It's not blessing because you're alive and blessing because you believe. It's blessing because you behave. And this is a blessing that you can behave your way into. And it's a blessing that you can behave your way out of. Say, no, no, Jeff, no. I believe in the unconditional love of God, like the prodigal son who comes back home and the dad is there to wrap his arms around his son and call for a welcome home feast. It's the unconditional love of God. Yeah, but to speak of God's unconditional love is not to speak of his unconditional blessing. Remember something with me. When the prodigal son was a runaway, burning through the family's cash, His brother would accuse him of spending it on alcohol and prostitutes. He ended up in a situation where he was in rags and starving to death. While a beloved child of the father, he was not living under the blessing of the father's household. When you resist God's movement in your life and cross your arms and just go, later, 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 I'll give you some attention later, do you know what kind of drought God can send into your life? Any kind he wants to that can get our attention back. And when our heart opens to God and when we begin to move toward God and say, I'm here, it's time, I want to move, do you know what kind of blessing and favor God can send into your life? any kind he wants to, just to say, oh, I just keep moving, keep moving. I so value your new direction. See, people, 
when you're stuck, I mean really stuck. Getting unstuck is, is really hard. It takes a lot of effort. People who go from stuck to started hunger for the blessing and favor of God to return to their lives. Now, let, let me use a family example so this kind of sticks with us a little bit. There's a dad, he's got a 16-year-old, new driver's license. Kid goes out, it's a school night, and the dad says, look, hey, look at me. 11 o'clock, I need you back at, repeat after me, at 11 o'clock. Kid says, God, he says, no, no, listen, uh, I got early morning meeting tomorrow. I won't sleep until I know you're home, and I need to get to bed because I got a hyper early meeting tomorrow, so 11 o'clock, got it, got it. Dad's up, 11 o'clock, comes and goes. 11.15, comes and goes. 11.30, comes and goes. 11.45, comes and goes. 11.52, there's the squeak of the door and quiet footsteps down the hallway. Dad flips on the hallway light. Hey, how you doing? You got your phone? I got 11.52. What time do you have? Hey, the traffic was really bad out there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. And the dad holds out his hand, just holds out the palm of his hand. And his son goes, what? Dad goes, this, my son, is the universal sign for give me the keys. <laughs> what? No, 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 give me the keys. Driving in this house is a privilege and not a right. I will be driving you to school tomorrow morning. Your mother will be picking you up. In two weeks from now, we will have another conversation about 11 o'clock and what it means. Give me the keys. All, all I'm saying here is this. At least give God the credit that you would give a solid parent trying to figure out how to warn and discipline a kid. God can remove his blessing and God can restore his blessing. People who go from stuck to start in often do so because they hunger, they hunger for the blessing of God to return to their lives. I got a question. How do you think this is going to go over with the people Haggai's talking to? I'm thinking this isn't going to go over so well. The, the, the Israelites did not have, did not always have passing grades when it came to responding to the voices of the prophets. I, I mean, you know, it's possible to come and say, this is what the Lord says, and to say, shut up, get out of town, or worse. How do you think this is going to go over? Crazy thing happens after that prophecy where Haggai links this and that, the crop failure and the temple in ruins. The people looked at each other and they went, okay, okay, it's time. And we are going to start work on the temple immediately. My friends, this is a beautiful story from Scripture because of the responsive hearts of God's people to the word of the Lord. So uh, let's embark on uh, the third characteristic of people that move from stuck to started. You ready? This is, this is so going to sound underwhelming. People who get from stuck to started do so because they believe, because they decide to get unstuck. They decide to get unstuck. It's, it, it's, it's the power of decision. And so we read this in verse, verse 12, where it says, uh, then Zerubbabel, that, that's the governor, then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, and also uh, Joshua, son of Zehadog, now he's the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, the governor, the head of uh, the, 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 the governmental world, and the high priest, the, the leader of the, the religious world, and all the people. They went, okay, it's time. Third characteristic of those who move from stuck to started is they decided to get unstuck. Now, deciding doesn't get you there. New Year's resolutions, anyone? Making a decision doesn't get you there, but almost any time we have powerful movement in our lives, almost always we can trace it back to a decision. 
And so while a decision won't get you there, the power of decision is often that that decision generates new activity in our lives. They decided. Man, how did they make such financial traction? They decided to cut up their credit cards. They just seem to be growing at a different pace than they used to. They decided to read a chapter of the Bible a day, a chapter of the Gospels or the book of Proverbs. They decided to awaken earlier and invite God into each morning. They decided to make the scary drive to a marriage counselor. They decided to get in their car on Sunday morning and drive to a church parking lot or to begin to watch online each week. It, it's the power of decision. The crazy thing about the Haggai story is that the actual rebuilding project, they actually start three weeks, three weeks after that prophecy of Haggai. Which means that the three weeks are a flurry of activity. They're dusting off building plans. They're buying building supplies. They're hiring general contractors and subcontractors. They're raising the money. They're reallocating their skilled tradesmen. I, I know we were building this addition on my house. Two Mondays from now, instead of showing up here, I need you to show up at the temple. We're calling a timeout on rebuilding our house while we throw our energy into building God's house. Month after month after month, year after year after year, it sat there, it sat there, it sat there as a ruin. Three weeks later, they begin. I want you to see something that is very precious to me. There's a, another prophecy that Haggai delivers and it comes right after they made the decision to rebuild the temple. It's in verse 13. We read these words. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. Four words. A four-word prophecy. I am with you, declares the Lord. It, 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 it's not a prophecy to scold it's not a prophecy to admonish. It's a prophecy just to say, I am so with you as you get started on this. What I love is they hadn't even started yet. They had just decided, but they were in motion. What is so tender to me here is the way that God desires to be present with those who are simply moving. Now, this is huge. Because if, if you got a little kind of perfectionist thing going on, it's kind of like God cannot possibly want to be with me and to bless me until this sucker is done and finished. It's like, go, no, 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 tell the people I'm with them just because they're moving. He's with you. He's with you in your movement. It's so important because as, as, as many of us Desire to get unstuck. It's, it's difficult to know what's the second step, what's the fourth step, what's the next step. And just those words, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. Those of you who today is your day and you're just going, Jeff, it's time, it's time, it's time. I would just like you to whisper something with, in fact, this is if all of us do this here in the courtyard and also uh, uh, those of you watching us, watching online, just say those words with me. Just say, he's with me me. Ready? Whisper these. Ready? He's with me. One more time. Ready? He's with me. He's with you in your movement. We've talked about Haggai today and moving from being stuck to getting started. I know that for many of you, you remember a time where you were stuck. And God brought about fresh movement in your lives and you started moving. And all this is for you is just a reminder to say, look, just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You don't want to drift back. But there are many today that are just stuck, 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 badly stuck. And this was God's word to you today. I just got to ask a question. 
for those of you who are badly stuck, do you remember when you quit? Do you remember when you got stuck? Do you remember when you quit? I mean, do you remember where you quit as a parent? I'm, I'm done parenting. I'm done with this child. She's, she, she, she's defiant. She's disobedient. She's disrespectful. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I don't care if she's two and a half. I'm done. I'm done. Do you remember, do you remember when you quit? Do you remember where you quit in your marriage? I mean, maybe you didn't move. Maybe you didn't force someone else to move out. Maybe you didn't file for divorce. But do you remember when you checked out? Was an argument that happened in a car? An argument that happened in a living room? Something that disrupted you so much that mentally you just went, I'm done. I quit. Do you remember when you quit? Uh, do, you, do you remember when you quit as a servant? I mean, you, you, you're involved in a church. Something damaging happened. Maybe trust was broken. Maybe you were hurt in some way. And you just went, look, I'm, I'm not giving up on the God thing. I'm not giving up on the Jesus thing. But I'm just tired with this whole church community thing. As far as a servant, life is serving others. I'm done. I'm done. Do you remember when you quit? Can I give you a two-word prayer that might just launch your journey from stuck to started? This is the prayer. I'm back. <laughs> what if you would just tell your heavenly father today, I'm back. I'm back. Or to at least pray the prayer. I don't know how to get back, but I want to be back. I'm back. As Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, there's this moment where there's this runaway kid that's burned through the family's cash. He is starving to death, and he's in rags, and I think probably covered with pig filth. And it says, he came to his senses. <laughs> there's this moment where he came to his senses. And he made that all-important decision, I will return to the Father. I will return to the Father. From a prophet that lived 500 years before the time of Jesus, we have a powerful story of movement, of people who went from stuck to started. Could, could this be your day? Say, I will return to the Father. Instead of saying someday, it's time. It's time. It's time to open my life again and to respond to the blessing and favor of my God again. I hunger for it. It's time. It's time. It's time. And we ask that our gracious God would move us, lead us, work within us, empower us, energize us, show us step one, lead us to a conversation with a wise spiritual advisor who can walk with us along the way. Gracious God, may we circle this date on the calendar as the date when we moved from stuck to started. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who came here for us. Amen. Can we thank the Lord and thank Jeff, please? Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Some of you right now might be thinking, boy, there's something, God put something on my heart weeks and months ago that really, it's, this is the moment. I feel like this is it. I want to encourage you to pray with somebody. Uh, if you're online, you're going to see an email address that you can respond and give a written prayer, and our prayer team will pray for that together. Or you can call the number on the screen, and there's somebody waiting right now to pray with you one-on-one -on -one and receive just that prayer, that encouragement, and God's power through prayer. And then Pastor Dennis and our prayer team are right up the stairs here underneath the big prayer sign, and they're ready to pray with you. So if you're here on the campus uh, and there's, you really feel like there's a joy or a need or an area you want to grow, 
please don't leave here without being prayed for. And then if you're new at Shoreline, if you're online and you're new, uh, we want to encourage you just to, to text the word welcome to the number you see right in front of you there. And if you text that word welcome, we will follow up with you and get to know you and answer your questions and give you a warm welcome to Shoreline Church. And if you're on campus here and you're new and you've never done so before, just take about three or four minutes, walk right back through the courtyard to the end here where the big bunch of balloons are. It looks like it's Heather over there. And we've got a team there and they want to give you a gift. Thank you for coming and just answer your questions and give you a warm personal welcome. As you go from this place, as we, as we finish our time together, may you hear the quiet voice of the Spirit of God whisper in your ear, it's time to get unstuck. May you have no shame or embarrassment about the fact that you're stuck in some area of your life because all of us are in some area, and pretty much all the time and in need of that move of the Holy Spirit. And may you respond to God's leading and take that next step and get people around you to encourage you and to pray for you. And may you become more and more of all that God has for you. And as you do, may the blessings that came because you were born and because you believe continue with you, but may the blessings that come because you're behaving in a way that honors Jesus flood your life in surprising ways. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you next Sunday morning.